Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. In about two weeks' time, an ultimatum will be tested in the tense American-Iranian relationship. Unusually, it was issued in Tehran and directed at Washington rather than the other way around. The Iranian parliament, or Majlis in Falsi, is threatened by legislation that if by the 21st of this month, sanctions reimposed on Iran by the Trump administration are not lifted, limits on Iranian non-compliance with its obligations under the 2015 nuclear agreement will be broken. Is the Biden administration going to succumb to this Iranian threat or stick to its declared intention of only returning to the deal once Iranian compliance resumes? To discuss the Iranian folder, joining us from central Israel is Brigadier General in Reserve Yossi Kuper Vassel, who is the Project Director on Middle East Developments at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Also joining us from elsewhere here in Jerusalem is Dr. Nir Bohms, who is a research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University. Thank you for joining us as well. Good to be here. And with us in the studio is our TV7 analyst and host of TV7's Watchmen Talk, uh, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, give us a broader understanding of the complexities related to this issue. Well, with all uh, due respect to the Iranian parliament, it is only one and not the most important um, of centers of power in uh, Tehran. Obviously, uh, there is President Rouhani, the uh, Revolutionary Guards, others, and above all, the uh, supreme authority, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei. And this is only one maneuver, one move in um, a war of nerves. Uh, perhaps this is too much uh, um, of uh, a title. Um, and um, this is uh, to go back to something which happened in the uh, Israeli-Egyptian confrontation uh, some uh, uh, 50 years ago, um, there was what uh, then Defense Minister Moshe Dayan called the talks about the talks. It's very preliminary. It's trying to set the framework for what will be negotiated regarding the negotiations. So one shouldn't hold one's breath what is going to happen on the 21st. Nothing will happen. The Biden administration has given its own signals. It does want to re-engage with uh, Iran. So we will have uh, to let events unfold later this month. Referring to uh, the intelligence experts on today's panel, General Kupil Vassar, I'd like to re receive your take on things as we're talking, of course, about, uh, as Mr. Owen said, one uh, body within uh, the Iranian uh, Ayatollah regime, uh, which uh, usually is not that significant considering the fact that it's regarded as more of an advisory council than anything else. But we can suspect probably that the entire move within the Majlis or the uh, Iranian parliament was actually orchestrated by uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei and the people surrounding him, which then uh, subsequently was also adopted by the government of uh, Hassan Khani, who uh, declared the move, including, of course, the foreign minister, Mohammad Javad Zarif, who declared it also uh, time and again, to be a legal binding law that needs to be adhered to. Of course, once uh, uh, you looked into the details of that specific law, you saw that also uh, the IAEA inspectors would be then barred post 21st of February entry into Iran and uh, the Iranians would then uh, be demanded to thwart inspections, something that the government later said, okay, this part maybe we won't follow through on. Uh, how do you see this whole uh, dynamic currently? Is this literally negotiating by means of, of words and actions on the ground or is this something beyond that? Well, the Iranians are moving in two directions simultaneously. One is uh, shortening the time that they need in order to have enough fissile material for first uh, nuclear device. That's uh, all the steps they are taking are closing the, the gap between them and uh, having this uh, goal. And uh, this is exactly where they stood before the JCPOA at uh, 2015. They are getting closer and closer to having enough fissile material for first nuclear device. At the same time, of course, what uh, uh, Amir said is totally correct. And uh, it's uh, at the same time used in order to put pressure on the Americans. 
So in this context, the Iranians are playing a game. They uh, uh, have these decisions by the by the parliament, and they follow them. The, these decisions are supported by the uh, leadership, especially by uh, the so-called supreme leader, uh, because it seems that they believe that by putting more pressure on the Americans, the Americans eventually will succumb to their demands and will rejoin the JCPOA, which of course is the best thing for the for the Iranians, because. Uh, even though they're getting closer to the uh, first uh, amount of uh, uh, nuclear material for a uh, nuclear device, this uh, track is very dangerous for them because if they are getting even closer than they are today, for example, if they take the move that they are supposed to take on February 21st, there is the chance that somebody will take action against them of uh, more sanctions or even some kind of a military action. So uh, they understand this is a very dangerous path to a nuclear bomb, whereas the JCPOA gives them a very secure path, a legitimate path, without any economic hardships, to be in 10 years in a position where they have, where they can have a vast amount of nuclear weapons without any threshold that they have to cross. So that's why they want to force the Americans to accept the second option of moving back to the JCPOA. And uh, not in order to, uh, they, they are not really interested in uh, trying now to have a nuclear uh, device uh, available to them because they know that in this track they are exposed to all kinds of threats that they uh, are very afraid of uh, getting uh, this experience of uh, being exposed to more sanctions. This is where they stand. In my mind, the 21st of February will come and they will, there are going to be more steps because they, they believe that they are still need more steps. They, you have to understand, at the same time, they're suffering from terrible economic conditions and they, they have to do something in order to uh, bring the Americans to a decision point where the sanctions will be lifted. And uh, they, uh, they believe that if they put more pressure on the Americans and when they listen to the new administration, I can understand why they believe that this is working because the administration doesn't, never, has not yet said that all options are the, on the table, has not yet said that more sanctions can come. There are no threats coming from the United States. The only thing that the Americans are saying, please come back to the JCPOA and you should be the first to do that before we start uh, coming back ourselves and open new negotiations. And as Amir said correctly, it is also a part of an effort to make sure that the only thing that's going to happen is coming back to the JCPOA and that there are not going to be negotiations about the missile project, no negotiations about better, better deal that will have real um, monitoring uh, the current deal, the JCPOA has really zero monitoring of uh, undeclared sites and of scientists. Uh, that will, a deal that would have no uh, limits, time limits, and the deal that would uh, take care of the Iranian subversive activity around the Middle East. All of those things, the Iranians want to make, deliver the message, convey the message that these are not for sale, these are not for discussion. And uh, that's the reason why, in my mind, in February, they're going to take more steps. Just announced today that they have activated more uh, cascades of uh, advanced centrifuges in uh, their underground facility in Natanz. It's, uh, they are all still in the same uh, track of putting more pressure on the United States. I believe this is what we're going to see in the coming uh, days and the coming weeks, including in, towards the end of February, if nothing happens before that. Indeed. Dr. Bombs, I'd like to hear your take on this, but also uh, in reference to U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who stated in a press conference, uh, uh, his first press conference, in which uh, he referred to the Iranian nuclear deal and said very clearly that uh, the JCPOA would serve as grounds to uh, negotiate a longer and broader deal in which other elements and topics uh, of international concern will be discussed, something, of course, uh, the Islamic Republic vehemently denies. And at the same stage, just three days after he made that statement, in which he also indicated more of a relaxed or uh, a low priority, if uh, you will, of returning uh, into uh, the JCPOA and only doing so after the Iranians themselves do so, as also General Kupilvassel noted, uh, which would then also include uh, a verification period, and then only th uh, after everything is, is conducted, uh, only then would the Americans consider re uh, lifting the sanctions. Uh, do you see uh, that uh, this is actually what triggered the Iranians to act, what, how they acted in recent days? 
and also uh, to what degree are the concerns in uh, the U.S. administration with regard to uh, the Iranians now having potentially enough fissile material within several weeks' time in order to uh, create one nuclear bomb? Is that something that uh, is truly alarming, or is this uh, uh, something that was to be expected? Well, let's begin with the concerns. I believe that as far as the Middle East is concerned, and perhaps broadly, uh, the Iran issue is both the most important and the most urgent issue. The most important, why? Because uh, this is a, a key issue, not just to the U.S., it's a key issue for all of its allies. This has to do not just with the nuclear file, it has to do uh, with the missiles uh, program, it has to do, and more so, with the activities of Iran uh, throughout uh, the region, uh, whether it is in Syria, in Lebanon, uh, in Yemen, and elsewhere. Um, all of that means that uh, for the U.S.'s allies, uh, Israel uh, included, uh, this issue was and remains a very critical issue uh, and a very important issue, more important than all other issues because this is more existential and more critical. Why urgent? Urgent because of what we just discussed. The Iranians are not waiting. They have violated the JCPOA and they are now moving further, at least with the statements and more we're looking at the IAEA report also with their actions uh, to basically say, look, we are continuing forward. Um, we are not uh, waiting for anything. And in some ways, I believe that they are trying to uh, uh, put additional pressure on the urgency of the matter, utilizing uh, an approach that seems to be different of a new administration that seeks on the one hand to be different than the previous administration and uh, that would like to bring back uh, uh, the negotiation formulas including some of the people who had managed this negotiation under President Obama. Um, and therefore the Iranians are saying look let's try to uh, show that this issue cannot wait and let's see if we can uh, bring about uh, perhaps uh, uh, either a quick victory or a certain degree of uh, progress. They desperately need the lifting of the sanctions. This is very much related and connected to the um, economic crisis. Uh, and, and part of the move might be for the Iranians to say, look, let's at least gain something. So we will be able to gain, uh, uh, to get into negotiations with a bit of a, a, a upper hand or showing a certain gain that we may be able to get from this administration, something we could not have uh, uh, gotten from the previous administration under President Trump. Uh, this is how I think all of these issues are uh, uh, connected. Of course, the pressure of, uh, of the allies, Israel included, is uh, not to adopt uh, this, uh, that approach. And, and certainly when it comes to the two conflicting statements uh, of Secretary Blinken, uh, I don't think that the allies would object a, a deal, a JCPOA deal, if that particular agreement would address all these concerns. And not just the nuclear concerns, but uh, the uh, concerns regarding uh, Iranian involvement in, in the region uh, and, and forcing, if at all possible, uh, a, a very different approach uh, to their conduct in the region. This is something that is uh, aspirational. I don't think the Iranians are uh, tuned to take uh, this type of a direction. And therefore, what remains is a, a, an Iranian move to say, look, let's perhaps bring this forward, gain uh, uh, potentially try to gain a, a certain uh, uh, relief, if at all uh, possible, or at least reassert our position that at this point may be able to uh, gain something uh, from a different administration that takes a different approach to the Iranian file. Mr. Oren, let's talk about CMT, credible military threat. Do you believe that Israel, over the past two weeks, we heard multiple messages about preparing for a credible military threat. Is this something that the Iranians are buying into? Will something like this really be able to materialize under the current Biden administration, considering that, uh, of course, there are plenty of conflicting reports right now? And then, of course, bringing the Europeans into the, the loop. Josep Borrell spoke with Antony Blinken on uh, one occasion this week in which he tried to convince the, his American counterpart of return into the deal, let's start uh, over and see how we can move from here. For that, we have to go back uh, to um, Ayatollah Khomeini and his followers, who used to call the United States the great Satan and Israel the uh, small Satan. And still do. And st they still do, and uh, this is how they see the world. They, of course, um, are quite concerned regarding uh, 
an independent Israeli strike, even though they uh, always uh, make sure that the message is, okay, you may hit us, but we will hit back at American forces in the Gulf, at American allies, including UAE, Bahrain, and others who normalize the relations with Israel. But the main thing is uh, to see the difference between the tactical and strategic outlooks of the Biden administration, which is what Israelis are doing exactly the way Iranians do. Tactically, um, this is not a problem regarding the conflict between the JCPOA and the other issues. As uh, Blinken said earlier this week, in parallel with the uh, renewed, refreshed JCPOA, the old 2015 deal, uh, as looked at uh, six years later, there will be another agreement negotiated on the other issues mentioned here. Whether the Iranians like it or not. Yes, they, so they, they may call it two uh, completely different um, agreements, one which only has to be resuscitated and the other and not yet negotiated. Um, but this is, this is not uh, the important thing. Strategically, and this um, speaks to what General Cooper has said regarding the fact that the Americans have not said that all options, namely the military option, um, are on the table and they have not made any threats. The Biden administration came in uh, with a different outlook, uh, not only uh, from uh, the Trump administration, but also from most of its predecessors. Perhaps the Carter administration, going back to the late 70s, was similar. It uh, worries about uh, climate uh, change. It works about uh, diversity and equality in the armed forces. And it made sure, in statements even by Defense Secretary Austin, as well as by Secretary of State Blinken, that defense um, is only secondary to diplomacy. And diplomacy also means allies. They want to coordinate with their European allies. They also need the Russians and the Chinese for the JCPOA if it is renewed. But uh, the emphasis is on negotiations first, and only later uh, defense is supposed to support state. General Kupil Vassil, some may argue that uh, recent investments by uh, China into Iran may constitute a, a, a rise of, of priorities uh, when it comes to the American interests uh, to mitigate Iranian influence in the region, because the, the one might also uh, face the other uh, to a certain degree. How do you see the Americans convince the Iranians beyond the current tools at their disposal uh, not to engage in malign activities, especially, of course, uh, with uh, the, the uh, real threat that even though under scrutinizing uh, U.S. sanctions, uh, we're not able to convince the Iranians to abandon uh, a nuclear weapon aspiration. Well, I, I think that uh, one has to understand how deep is the commitment of Iran to uh, try and uh, have nuclear weapons. I mean, Iran is a, is a government with a mission. It has to export the revolution. It has to change the world. And uh, they, uh, to, to expect them to uh, willingly accept some sort of an arrangement that would uh, prevent them from having uh, nuclear weapons is, uh, is very difficult. And because of that, and they will try any, any channel, any path that can lead them to having nuclear weapons, even if it is involved in all kinds of hardship. And uh, joining hands with the Chinese, the Chinese are ready to help them in order to, uh, to uh, deliver some messages to the Americans and to weaken America. Uh, this is something natural for the, for the Iranians. Much of their program was built on cooperation with China. And uh, I expect them to, to go on with their, this uh, cooperation with China. This is why they raised this issue of uh, having a strategic uh, agreement with China. And uh, it's the Chinese that are uh, uh, considering whether to go forward or not. Because the Chinese, though they are confronting the United States, they want to uh, make sure that they are not uh, over, uh, overgoing with their, what, uh, with their activities. That's where the question mark should be. What will China do that or not? 
if the Iranians were able to uh, get the Chinese on board for a treat towards uh, an, a nuclear Iran, uh, which they did in the past, uh, it's uh, something that would definitely do. If the Chinese knew that this may lead to some sort of instability that can have an, a negative impact on their economic uh, prosperity, then they will hesitate even more than they do today uh, about uh, going in this direction. That's where they stand. In my mind, uh, the, uh, by the way, the Iranians do realize that uh, uh, there is the possibility of a, a real military option, a credible military threat, as you, as you called it. And uh, they need the Chinese also in order to confront this kind of threat. The Chinese are those who can uh, harm the international unity, together with the Russians, by the way. Uh, in uh, confronting Iran, and that's why they, it's very important for them to have the better relations with China and uh, with Russia, and uh, to weaken the, the American position. And well, anyhow, it's, it's going to be very much standing on its own, because even the Europeans don't want to see any escalation. So mm -hmm. the Iranians are playing here a very sophisticated game, but as long as the Americans uh, insist on not going back to the deal, unless the Iranians do that uh, in a verifiable manner uh, and uh, accept some sort of negotiations afterwards, then uh, the Iranians, with all the support of China and Russia and the, the Europeans, are unable to really improve their conditions. And, uh, and the fact is that we are uh, 10 days after, uh, or two, two weeks after the inauguration of the new, uh, new administration in Washington, and the sanctions are still in place. Indeed. Dr. Bums, uh, as a expert on uh, the Arab Gulf world, uh, to what degree do you see uh, concerns there materialize into action? And uh, to what degree also do you see a, a deepening of, of cooperation uh, between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, for instance, uh, now that also the Biden administration has decided to suspend its weapon sales to both Saudi Arabia and the UAE? Uh, for, of course, pending review uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, considering whether uh, the, the agreements signed were indeed uh, as binding as the Trump administration intended them to be. Well, granted, all these issues are uh, related. And yesterday I heard uh, Ambassador Yusuf al uh, speaking about this very issue, uh, trying to uh, reassure that uh, this procedure of the suspension of the uh, deal uh, with the F-35 uh, is a more of a technical procedure and that it's eventually uh, it will be approved that of course the need uh, for that uh, has something to do with security concerns in the region and in the Gulf and in the GCC when it comes to security concern and uh, the second uh, word uh, after that is Iran. Uh, the process of collaboration uh, around this issue between the Gulf uh, and Israel started uh, actually very much in tandem with the JCPOA. Uh, one of the things, uh, or perhaps one of the blessings that President Obama had brought uh, with this process, with, on the one hand, uh, pushing the JCPOA, on the other hand, given a very clear message that the United States is actually distancing itself from the region, it pushed the partners to say, well, look, the big brother, uh, who used to be very involved here, maybe distancing and maybe even uh, changing alliances, this is the time for us to work together. That's partially, uh, not solely, but partially what prompted uh, the dynamic that uh, eventually uh, manifested itself with the Abraham uh, Accords, uh, which, of course, uh, has a, a, a security uh, dimension to them with the uh, attempt to create a much stronger axis in the Middle East uh, with the Gulf countries, with Israel, with other moderate uh, states that are saying uh, both to the Americans and also to each other that, first of all, we have challenges that we need to work on together. Uh, Iran being one of them, and a very significant one. Uh, fundamentalism, terrorism, uh, radical Islam being uh, the second one. And second, that we now have a, a more formidable front when it comes to the Biden administration, where uh, a row of allies saying that uh, we have a, a united position and united front, and uh, we would like to make sure that you know, the, the, the new administration is uh, taking them into uh, taking that into consideration. Um, that's uh, not the only uh, uh, piece, or the not, not that's not the only uh, 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 pillar upon which uh, the Abraham Accord sits. But that certainly has been part of the process that has led to this very interesting dynamic. 
Indeed. Mr. Owen? Well, you know, when, when we talk about credible military threats, um, in addition to what uh, the uh, region will have to absorb uh, regarding an Iranian response, one can never forget that uh, most Israeli weapon systems, those uh, which uh, could ostensibly be used in such a strike, are American-made and are given to Israel with some conditions. Uh, there are several strings attached. And one should always remember that when Israel struck Osirak in 1981, without the uh, Reagan administration being forewarned, um, there was a short-term embargo on F-16s, because F-16s were used. When Israel struck the Syrian reactor in 2007, it was only with the full knowledge, agreement, and coordination between the Olmert government and the Bush administration. So one uh, cannot really imagine, and especially in Tehran, they will not imagine, even if the opposite uh, uh, turns out to be true, that Israel will do anything without the express approval of the Biden administration. General Kupelwasser, uh, in 20 seconds, do you believe that Israel could attack Iran without an American approval? It could, but would it, would it be a wise move? That's a totally different story. It's, uh, Israel probably has capabilities, and as uh, General Kohavi, the chief of staff, said, uh, it's planning to have more capabilities and invest more uh, resources in building better capabilities to strike Iran if necessary. And if uh, the, the need is there, it, it can do that without American consent. Uh, but of course, it's much better to do that with, with the Americans or have the Americans do that. This is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank General Kupelwasser, Dr. Bohms, and Mr. Oren for being in today's program. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.